It's one minute past the appointed hour. I'm being lenient because this is the last session. This session is called Scaling Up. You may remember that a subtitle of the conference was Scaling Up to Meet the Challenge. And the talks that we're going to be hearing in the next hour and a quarter are on that subject. And we're going to start with Peter Robertson. Thank you very much, Peter. OK, thanks very much. OK, so I'm Pete Robertson. I'm from the University of Newcastle, but spent a lot of my career working in government in UK. Um, and representing work by a whole range of different people from all sorts of different sources. But I wanted to talk a bit about scale and the challenge that for this session is about, as we heard, about scaling up. And there's a number of different pressures that are going to push for control and management at increasing scales. Obviously, we've had a lot of talks in the last couple of days about amazing work being done on islands at ever-increasing scales and the challenges and the successes of that. We got the Honolulu Challenge saying we've got to have aspirations, we've got to think about working at bigger scales. And here, near a home, we've also got new regulations coming into place within the European Union, um, which are going to place responsibilities on member states across Europe to start managing and controlling invasive species in ways that many of them haven't in the past. And they're going to raise all sorts of challenges of scale on a continental level that we need to think about as well. So what I wanted to do in the next couple of minutes is say a bit that you all know already about islands, but then think about some of the other activities and experience that have been going on on more larger land masses and the challenges and differences and in some cases similarities with what you've been seeing on islands. So, you know, the conference itself has been talking about the successes, the, the increase, ever-increasing number of island eradications that have taken place, the increasing scales that have gone on with those. There's some amazing stories out there. Alongside that, though, islands tend, by definition, to be relatively small, and they tend to have clear boundaries. There's experience out there as well about managing invasive species on larger land masses. What's an island, what's a mainland is a pretty futile discussion. You know, when does a kitten become a cat? But if we think of it just in terms of scale, there's a lot out there at, within large land masses that can tell us things about large scale management. And what we're seeing is the experience that's taking place on islands now. Some of the really big campaigns that have been going on are getting to the scales where you're starting to blur that boundary with mainland and to compare with some of the scales of things that have gone on on larger land masses. I talked about EU legislation is going to drive a whole new suite of management approaches um, within Europe and the aspirations that we're hearing about from New Zealand as well for predator-free New Zealand and the scale that some of those things are going to have to operate at. So what do we know about eradications and control on large land masses? And there's a long history in this part of the world on dealing with invasive mammals in particular, going back to the 1930s, um, removing them from Ireland, from Great Britain, from bits of the continent as well. And a list of species there where there have been substantial success stories over that time. But we're talking here about work that's gone on over nine different decades. But taking all of those projects, the muskrat work, that took place in Ireland and Britain in the 1930s when there were five separate muskrat eradications in different regions. The work on koi pew um, and porcupine, which took place in the 70s and 80s. And the more recent work on mink and variety of different squirrels that's taken place um, in recent decades. And we can see, the, first of all, the areas that we're talking about here. Examples down at relatively small scales, but going up uh, with Koipu to about 20,000 square kilometers of ground that was covered in that one, which still remains the largest mammalian eradication that's been done in those terms. We're looking here at man years of effort. You can't get cost figures going back to the 1930s that mean anything, but there's still records in there in the National Archives about the effort that went in in terms of trapper years that went into these things. So we're putting it up here as man years of effort to get around some of those time problems that go with this sort of data. And it's worth saying as well that there are some pretty spectacular failures that we need to remember as well. Um, in particular, an attempted national mink eradication that you know here very much about, that's the nature of failures. 
um, but 100 man years of effort that was wasted in the 1960s and 70s trying to do a national eradication of mink, which never really caught up with the spread of the population. And interestingly, those fall quite clearly below the effort line of the successes. Okay, so there's some work's gone on at some interesting scales, but how does this compare with islands? What are the similarities and differences in those relationships that we're starting to see? Okay, so there's a lot of data out there on the costs of island eradications. This is particularly work from Martins et al. 2006, pulled together a lot of data on the costs of mammal eradications on islands, and they're represented here in blue. I've put the larger scale eradications that I've just discussed up there in red on the assumption that each man year costs 50,000 US dollars once you take all of the costs together of traps and vehicles and manpower together. So it's an estimated cost if were we to do those things again today. Since Martin's study, there's been a number of particularly large island eradications as well that I wanted to include in there, the three green ones up at the top. You'll have been hearing about them today. John, I hope I've got your costs right in terms of manpower, but that's it's an extrapolation from your manpower figures that you published. And just for interest, some plant eradications that have been costed in similar ways coming out of California. And really interestingly, even though we're talking about quite different landscapes, different scales, we're seeing a pretty consistent pattern in here in terms of the cost and the effort that's required to achieve eradication, regardless of whether you're talking about islands or more mainland situations. The slope of that line is interesting as well. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of slope. Every time you double the area that you're dealing with, you get a 10% reduction in cost per unit area. And that seems to be constant as you go up that graph. So as you move at bigger scales, sure, it costs more in total, but you're starting to get efficiencies of scale coming through right across the board. But there are differences. You know, cost and effort might appear to show similar things. But when it comes to defining objectives, many of these larger control programs that have taken place, there's issues around exactly what are their objectives and the definition of those. And we all know the classic paper, Bonford and O'Brien, who made a very clear separation in terms of two objectives for wildlife management programs, eradication and a nice clear definition of that, and ongoing control as areas where you need to have continued input of effort. And being clear about which of those you fall into has been really useful in guiding a whole suite of island eradications over the years. And at the heart of that are the three conditions that you have to meet, lined up there at the top. But when you're starting to talk about large land masses, it often gets pretty difficult to apply these things um, or to meet them. So there's questions of, can you actually, are they actually applicable? Can you work out what the boundaries of your population is when you're dealing with a population within a large land mass? Can you actually achieve those? Because in many cases, you're going to have continued issues with immigration at some of these large scales. As scale goes up as well, you tend to get an increased probability that you're going to have inaccessible habitats within there for some reason, be it cities, be it extreme mountains or whatever. And I think all four of those things that you see there are commonly encountered on large land masses when you try and apply those criteria. Against that, though, work on large land masses often does lead to large-scale complete removal of a species over large areas. But it, so it's not really well described as ongoing control either, even though it's clearly not eradication in the classic term. And I know Piero talked on very similar lines in his keynote about managing to zero. We've been calling it complete removal within an area as an interim, of, as a, an objective that falls between true eradication and ongoing control to better describe the circumstances that we're often dealing with. With it being complete removal of a species, but with ongoing effort required to maintain those cleared areas as free. And there are examples with different features of where this has been applied on larger land masses. So three examples here from the UK where we've been managing on a large scale, but they don't 
necessarily meet the precise definition of eradication that's applied on an island basis. So, mink in the Hebrides, an eradication that's now in total, I think, about 500 odd square kilometers, but initially was a phased program clearing the southern area first, maintaining a buffer on a series of islands and stepping stone islands, which you can see with the red barriers, gaining expertise there before the decision was taken to move to complete eradication throughout the archipelago. So removal to a barrier, key in the early stages of that, but with that species, we knew it was never going to hold forever. Grey squirrels, widespread throughout UK. The chances of doing a national eradication on the grey squirrel is negligible at the moment with the technologies available. But to protect the native red with which it competes, Successful programs on large-scale offshore islands. This is Anglesey in North Wales. I think it's about 300 square kilometers in size. It's been cleared of greys through trapping. And a boundary has been maintained between it and the mainland with trapping on the mainland to reduce ingress um, to keep Anglesey free. And new work just started, which is going to extend that cleared area up to a natural boundary on the North Wales coast, where the mountains meet the sea, so that we have removal off the neighboring coastline as well. But it's going to require continued effort. These things are not something you can do and walk away from. Lastly, the ruddy duck. We heard a bit about um, how birds <coughs> lag behind, and there aren't that many examples. To my knowledge, ruddy duck is the biggest eradication in terms of geographic scale. Um, we've now cleared GB from, or UK and Ireland from breeding birds. There's still a number of males floating around that we know about, but as far as we can tell at the moment, we've managed to clear the island in terms of effective breeding. However, they remain on the continent of Europe. There's another five states there that still have breeding animals. Um, taken together, we've cleared 220,000 square kilometers of Britain of the ruddy duck. Um, if it's done across the rest of Europe, that will be one and a half million square kilometers as an eradication. So at the moment, we hold the line at the English Channel with surveillance and, if necessary, control of incoming birds to try and maintain that status within the UK. Another example is where, within large land masses, we've got very discrete populations. They're effectively islands of habitat with a population in them. And you can apply many of the same methods that you've been applying on offshore islands to habitat islands. This is, start over this side, this is Monk Parakeet, which has established itself in a range of European cities, whole cluster of them there in Spain, but examples in London and Amsterdam as well, with the prospect of control within island populations for this species. There's work ongoing in London to try and remove monk parakeet as a breeding species from within the conurbation of London at the moment. But the prospect there of dealing with islands within habitats within a larger landmass. Similarly, Pallas's squirrel here, discrete populations throughout much of Europe, but you have the prospect of dealing with it as an island basis. And similarly, within larger islands, areas where you may not be able to completely clear and eradicate a species, but by control at increasing scale, you can completely remove within the center of an area, even though effort is required around the boundaries. I mentioned, though, that the EU are putting together legislation and an increasing list of species on which member states will have to act. And the scales that they're dealing with and the number of member states that contain some of these species presents particular challenges. There are 79 species either on the list or proposed for consideration on the European list at present. And some of these species are already present in significant numbers of EU member states. Looking at them, about 50% of the species that have been listed are already present in more than five European states. Two more. And this limits or presents particular challenges. You can see there one's appropriate for prevention, but there are significant numbers now where ongoing control is probably the only realistic prospect. So in summary, differences but also similarities between islands and mainlands. Scale, as we've heard, is a major issue 
but we need ways of prioritizing not just the risk that's posed by these species, but the realistic prospects of management. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Pete. Our next speaker is a close friend and a living legend. And all the more remarkable that he's living because he's spent more time in helicopters, I suspect, than the rest of the room put together. But here he is in Dundee, having accomplished a remarkable series of triumphs during his uh, working life. Peter Garden talking about the history of what he's been doing effectively on New Zealand. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Tony. <clears throat> Over the past few days, we've talked about scaling up and uh, looking to the future. But I'd like to pause a little and look back <clears throat> at where we've come from and why a small island nation at the bottom of the globe has become a leader of habitat restoration. I'm getting away ahead of ourselves here, but... <clears throat> yep. Um, rats and mice uh, came with us with the sealers and... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the rats and mice arrived with the, uh, the um, sealers and whalers that came subsequent to that. Uh, but, it, but it was rabbits that, that uh, first became obvious as um, pest species. <clears throat> and early, early aerial application of toxins to control these involved the use of fixed-wing aircraft. However, it was the ship rat invasion of Big South Cape Island and the extinction of several endemic species in, uh, invertebrate, uh, vertebrates uh, that sent shockwaves through conservation circles. This disaster led to the increased uh, interest in ecology of rodents and their impact on our native species. <clears throat> A major step uh, in saving our endangered species occurred in 1987. The amalgamation of the Forest Service, the Department of Lands and Survey and the Wildlife Service into one government department, the Department of Lands and Survey, commonly referred to as DOC. <clears throat> Previously, various departments and agencies have been competing for government funding, often in duplication. It had been established by Brian Bell and Don Merton after the Big South Cape eruption <clears throat> there was a need to create ha safe habitat for the growing numbers of endangered species. Offshore islands offered the best opportunity for this, but many of these had invasive predators that needed to be expirated before reintroducing native wild bird life. This required the understanding of the biology of the target predator, establishing the risks to non-targets, developing treatment procedures and ensuring sufficient toxins are delivered to every target animal. Doc said about creating island sanctuaries or lifeboats. <coughs> Kapiti Island in 1996, Putahinu and Rarotoka in 1997, uh, Codfish Whenua Hau in 1998, but it was the 11,300 hectare Campbell Island project in, in 2001 that attracted international interest. Some of the key drivers of the technology in New Zealand have been a dramatic loss of biodiversity. A number of species have gone extinct within our lifetime. The availability of suitable pilots the advanced and accurate dispersal equipment, the development of blood anticoagulant toxins, and the access to satellite navigation systems. New Zealand's involvement in agricultural aviation began post-World War II, 
with a surplus of pilots and training aircraft and a requirement to spread seed and fertiliser on hill country, an industry soon developed. By the early 1960s, a considerable pool of pilots experience in parallel swath application techniques existed. The unique qualities of the helicopter were recognised in the early 1960s. The ability to attach a range of dispersal equipment have made it an ideal platform for pest control operations. The designing of specialised bait and dispersal and loading equipment The development of blood anticoagulant toxins. First generation pindone and diclathinone were useful, but it was the development of second generation bradificum that led it to become the toxin of choice for many offshore island rodent eradication programs. <clears throat> and finally, the final key was this, the civilian development of the US military satellite navigation system or GPS to provide very accurate track guidance and recording of flight data and ground coverage. The conservation world became interested and New Zealand practitioners started taking their skills to the world with advice, experienced staff, equipment and support. The Department of Conservation had established an internal group, the Island Eradication Advisory Group, to peer review and support operations across the country. This group is now available to advise international operations on the basis that shared developed systems and procedures is a valuable contribution and often provides a two-way flow of communication or information. Expertise, ground and flight staff with background experience in habitat restoration involving eradication, eradicating pest species began helping with overseas operations. A range of specialised equipment is offered by several companies. GPS guidance equipment, dispersal and loading equipment, aircraft support systems and remote communication equipment. And support is offered with training programs and manual te templates and support in developing eradication projects are offered by some companies. Some of the international operations supported from New Zealand. The New Zealand Department of Conservation has now followed international lead in carrying out eradication operations as joint venture projects. A number of private conservation trusts now support DOC in these programs. The most recent of these was the removal of mice from the 2,000 hectare Antipodes Island. We may have come a long way but numerous species are still at risk and there are many battles ahead. By sharing our knowledge and experience and developing new tools, I believe that we may have turned the corner in reducing biodiversity loss. Thank you. Pete's such a practice speaker, he's even allowed time for a question or two. <laughs> Do you have any? Thank you. Would you, yeah, coming down on your left. 
Um, can you just elaborate a little bit on the, tra the types of training programs that uh, New Zealand, either DOC or some of the companies can provide? Well, it's, it's been obvious to us for a while that we've got a relatively small pool of pilots that are experienced in doing these operations and, and we know there are plenty of pilots out there who could be trained up to do these projects. The skill levels are there, it's just a matter of upskilling them to, uh, to accept the, uh, the um, specific requirements that, are, that an eradication needs over and, over and above a control operation. So we are working on, on programs to train pilots. Any others? I see none. Okay, thank you very much, Pete. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Pete mentioned the Antipodes mouse operation. And by coincidence, our next speaker led that project, the magnificent effort, and looking good so far, as I understand. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tony. Kia ora tato. My name is Stephen Horn, and I work for the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. Um, I was a project manager for the Antipodes Island mouse eradication, which uh, was attempted in winter last year. We don't know the outcome of the project yet, but uh, today I'm going to talk about the method and um, discuss some of the preliminary results. Um, Peter actually played quite an influential role in this project as well um, at a critical stage when we couldn't find any helicopters he gave us quite a lot of support so um, I'm sure he's influenced a lot of other projects around the world as well. Uh, so the Antipodes are quite remote, 760 kilometres offshore from mainland New Zealand. They're protected as a nature reserve and also recognised internationally um, and they're made up of a the main Antipodes island had about 2,000 hectares and several offshore islands and rock stacks. So what's the problem? Um, well, to justify my slot in the scaling up um, sequence, uh, this was the largest mouse eradication attempted where mice are the sole mammalian pest species, and if you look hard enough, you'll find a world first for your project as well. Um, Mice arrived sometime in the 19th century, probably with sealers or as a result of a shipwreck. And they've had a severe impact on the conservation values ever since. They appear to have suppressed some seabird species and have been responsible for the local extinction of at least two tacks of invertebrates. And eradicating mice will also protect us from the potential future uh, attacks on um, seabird species such as the nationally critical Antipodean albatross. There's four endemic taxa of land birds on Antipodes as well. And they are significant to the project because mice compete with some of these for food. But also they were thought to be at the biggest risk from a baiting operation. And they include the, uh, an endemic subspecies of the New Zealand pipit, an endemic subspecies of the subantarctic snipe, and two endemic species of parakeets, the Rayshex parakeet with the red crown and Antipodes Island parakeet. In winter 2013, we, we conducted non-toxic bait uptake trials, and we found that 100% of the mice in the trial area uh, did consume the bait. But we also found that some pipits consumed the bait. However, there wasn't any sign of parakeets, um, snipe, or giant petrels or skewer consuming bait, so there was a lower apparent risk evident from the study. When planning started, uh, mice were only known on Antipodes Island, they're just over 2,000 hectares, but fortunately, based on um, previous studies, we were confident enough that mice weren't present on Bolins Island and Archway Island, which provided us a 58.8 hectare reserve where bait wouldn't be spread, um, limiting the risk to the populations of um, land birds. Leeward Island and Audley's Islet were both close enough to Antipodes Island that we included them in the treatment area. However, when the Windward Islands um, were monitored during the operation before bait was spread, and uh, subsequently we found no, we didn't detect any mice, so we removed them from the treatment area as well. So this, this extended our reserve area to 74 hectares. Now this is one of the most complex, logistically um, complex projects that DOC has undertaken in recent years. 
mostly due to the remote site, uh, the poor weather, um, the lack of infrastructure, and the lack of a shipping harbour. The baiting prescription followed best practice, which we've heard of quite a lot this week, um, was for two comprehensive treatments in the winter. Uh, the nominal application rates were eight, 16 kilos per hectare for the first treatment and 8 kilos per hectare for the second treatment. And the preferred minimum, minimum interval between the treatments was 14 days. Additional bait would also be applied to the coastal boundary, other high-risk areas such as steep slopes, rock stacks, and coastal cliffs. And as you can see, there's plenty of suitable vegetated habitat on the um, coastal cliffs which surround the majority of the island. Um, bait would also be applied by hand under structures and in bait, st bait stations inside structures. So biosecurity was a major part of our preparations and a dedicated dock team conducted quarantine checks on items coming from all around the country. 65 tonnes of Pest Off 20R were produced by Aurelian in Whanganui and trucks south for departure, uh, where it was loaded into wooden bait pods for uh, transport and storage on the island. And three months before the operation, pilots had a chance to practice takeoff and landing from the cargo ship that we contracted uh, to provide transport. So transport was provided by two vessels, uh, the passenger yacht Avoe, which departed Dunedin with 12 people, and um, the cargo ship, the Norfolk Guardian, which was loaded in Timaru and left with an additional seven people. And if you enjoy a good feed of neck chops, then that's the vessel for you. <laughs> um, a couple of days after arriving, we uh, were able to unload the helicopters, and it took about 90 minutes to extract and um, prepare these for takeoff. In over 12 days of unloading, we completed 250 loads ashore with only five of those days um, operable due to weather. A big part of the uh, setup was um, establishing a helicopter hangar to protect helicopters while they're on the island. This, incl <laughs> this included construction of a large wooden platform and uh, helicopter hangar which was anchored by 38 tonnes of water ballast in 1,000 litre tanks and provided us an excellent basketball court as well as um, <laughs> protection for the helicopters. So by day 12 our field camp was established um, and the transport vessels departed with the six extra staff that we brought down to help with construction. That left an operational team of 13 people including two pilots, a chef, a helicopter engineer, an eradication expert, a GIS technician, and a six-person bait loading team to manually load the bait, which included two of our friends from Island Conservation. So despite being ready by the 9th of June to start baiting, it was a further nine days before we were able to commence due to the weather. Um, treatment one was completed in six-part days between the 18th and 29th of June and treatment, treatment two was completed much faster between the 8th and 12th of July in three part days. The baiting was delayed through low visibility um, but also strong winds at the time. So the changeable weather didn't allow for more than three and a half hours of continuous baiting at any one time. So the work proceeded in, in an incremental fashion uh, to complete baiting as the opportunities arose. So a rolling front approach was used and we worked hard to minimise the open fronts. Um, and when there was an interruption of greater than three days, we went back and re the previous two bait swaths. So the first application uh, started with a 54 hectare area that um, incorporated all of the structures on the island. It was just a brief weather window, but it provided us the opportunity to actually trial all our systems and machinery um, following a long transportation to, to the island. Um, and it was quite important to be able to start the hand baiting inside the structures early in the program, because this is where the highest risk of alternative food sources was for mice. And 
the last mice that we detected on the island and the small amount of monitoring we did around the accommodation area was 20 days after the initial bait application. So baiting and treatment one com, um, continued on the 21st and 22nd of June when most of it was done, but it took a further week to complete the last 3% down here over three days of operations in the next week, which was finally completed on the 29th of June. And the DOC GIS technician used bait density maps to um, ensure that we had complete coverage, as you heard David talking about yesterday, um, to help identify areas where the target sowing rate wasn't met, but it was found that we had comprehensive coverage and no apparent gaps. This map uh, is interrogating the preferred minimum interval of 14 days between the treatments. Because it was done incrementally, that varied over the island, but 97% of the island was uh, had a gap of 16 days or more. With 3% down in the bottom corner, that was um, 10 days. And the decision was taken to commence less than 14 days after the first application based on the brief weather windows that we'd had to that point. Our engagement was, was a significant part of this project and the establishment of internet um, satellite availability really revolutionised our ability to communicate the project to an interested public. So there's hard work from a number of staff which achieved a hugely positive result, including seven primetime news stories in New Zealand. Sometimes it's a bit quiet in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> and over 70,000 Facebook views on our, on our Facebook page in uh, June. And we also communicated with a um, primary school up in Northland who sent us a whole lot of letters during the operation and we responded. Um, and we did a Skype uh, chat with them over the internet as well, which was hugely successful. So some of the operational monitoring included uh, keeping an eye on the antipode and albatross that were present at the load site. So we placed, we placed our bait pods to avoid turbulence for the helicopters to make it as safe as possible for their operations, but also to minimise the impact on the antipode and albatross chicks which were present over winter. Um, there were seven chicks within 50 metres of the operational area, and the closest being 15 metres away from the line of bait pods. Uh, six out of seven of these successfully fledged in summer 2017, which is 86%, compared to 90% in the study area. So there was no apparent impact. We used distance sampling to look at non-target species, um, and we found that there was a significant impact on both parakeet species as well as the pipits. Uh, but by summer, February 2017, there was um, a large recovery in all of those species. And a small amount of monitoring that was done, 900 tracking tunnel nights around the reef, po reef point area where the accommodation is in February, found uh, no sign of mice so far, so fingers crossed. We did, however, find two weed plants in the operational areas um, in the summer, so that was an important uh, reason for returning. And result monitoring will be conducted in February um, next year. So some lessons from the project. Important to engage technical advice really early in the project, including non-target species advice. Uh, monitoring must be well designed for the constraints of such a remote site. Experienced eradication pilots are essential for accurate bait application in challenging conditions. Expertise is necessary in the operational team for self-sufficiency. And the rolling front approach work to complete baiting where short, opportunity to, short opportunities exist. And as I mentioned, biosecurity surveillance following high-risk activities in a sensitive site are um, critical. So I'd just like to thank our, public, uh, our supporters, the Morgan Foundation, the public donors, WWF New Zealand and Island Conservation, and also Aurelian for making this talk possible for my presence here. Thank you. We do have time for a question or two. You and someone have a mic behind you. Behind you. He's behind you. Hello. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts about the potential use of drone technology in these kinds of uh, eradications of aerial baiting? Um, 
I, th I think there's some drones that can take a, a load of something like 10 or 15 kilos. I think James Austin knows a bit more about this than me. It could be good for future access to some of those cliff baiting areas. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a lot of work for pilots with a differential bucket to um, bait the cliff areas. We were using a 30, 30 meter altitude gain with each pass on the cliff. So it, it takes one dedicated pilot um, approximately half of our baiting time to complete all that coastal work. So it's, it's possible, but it may be also for actually checking that bait did get onto those vegetated slopes and stick there, but one of the problems in this sort of area is it's so windy most of the time that a drone would, you know, disappear, so, yeah. Any others back there? Do we have a mic on this side? Best with the mic. R really interesting talk, super work. Um, I was curious about the, the the birds that you mentioned that you did distance sampling and presumably the abundance was reduced by the operation um, and then it recovered within a year and I was just curious how that all went. Uh, yes, yeah, so we didn't have any detection of parakeets eating bait during those winter trials but they definitely were eating bait during the operation. Um, it was a much longer period of exposure during the operation than during the trials. Um, but thankfully when the scientists went back in February um, they were seeing a huge abundance of pipits in particular. There was a flush of um, an, an endemic fly, there was a flush of moths um, and pipits in particular were possibly on their second clutch um, and you know, were, were seen with um, insects in their mouths which they hadn't really been obvious before. Um, and parakeets were both fledging just at the time that they were completing the distance sampling. So we saw good breeding um, activity. And, and that is what we predicted, a short-term impact um, on some of these species, followed by you know, significant long-term um, gains for those species um, and, and quick recovery, obviously, without the, hopefully without the impact of mice in the future. Thank you very much, Thanks, Steve. Steve. Excellent effort. <laughs> Next up, Claire from the RSPB and appropriately a large cast because the title of her talk is Married Bliss and Shotgun Weddings, <laughs> Effective Partnerships for Island Restoration. Okay, so thank you. Thank you all for staying until this session and thank you very much for, to the organisers for the opportunity to talk about partnerships. Now, as I've heard from many other of the speakers this week, I'm not a social scientist either. I'm also not a marriage guidance counsellor or professional. And, um, and as Steve Cranwell said earlier, right, uh, describing partnerships and talking about them is actually really hard. When I put this together, I thought, what, what more of a natural topic for this conference than partnerships? We're all doing it. We're all working with others all the time. It'll be a real like, breeze to write this talk. It'll be fantastic. But actually, it's been like nailing jelly to a wall. And uh, uh, yeah. Um, so when I was preparing the talk, I came across this quote, which I liked. I thought for an audience with a fair number of New Zealanders, it would be uh, appropriate to refer to the Lord of the Rings. Um, and, and looking back at some of the partnerships that I've been part of, um, there's certainly a cast of unusual individuals, uh, sometimes going towards what might be a, a, a situation where someone might have their finger taken off by something quite unpleasant. Um, and sometimes the goal seems pretty impossible to achieve. But when you have a really good partnership, it, it really can achieve more than the sum of what the individual partners could do by themselves. And that's what we're all trying to do. So, um, we've heard this story before. When, when island eradications first started out, um, they were really done by a few good, good individuals, maybe not all men, but uh, I think often wearing shorts of this nature <laughs> um, from all over the world, um, and done for the benefit of threatened species. So the goal was um, make some safe places for these things to go so that we can all um, keep them into the future. 
And so after these, these few individuals were involved and everyone started to see the benefits, more organisations got involved, some of them non-governmental, some of the early ops were also um, done by non-governments, but bigger, bigger kind of NGOs started to see this work and think, this is great, and there were some that were even formed um, lastly just to do this, so Island Conservation, a great organisation whose, whose real goal is to do this work for the benefit of nature. And then businesses also got involved, so some of them were island owners, some of them were professionals like Peter and, and the guys from Aurelian and Bell who supply products that these operations rely on. Maybe not Alan Sugar yet, but you know, we've, we've got our aspirations. And, uh, and then communities. So um, communities inhabited islands, like the Cities Project, um, community groups who have interest in islands, friends groups, have uh, begun to drive these projects. And as James uh, talked about in his keynote, understanding the motivation of those groups, the reasons that they want to get involved in these projects has become increasingly important. So back when it was simple, um, someone had an idea. They thought about their favourite island and they thought, yeah, we'll, we'll get rid of the pests on that. And to start with, that might have been quite simple. It might have been a small island with a single owner in a single government jurisdiction. Um, yeah, maybe with a single pest on it even. Imagine that. Um, but increasingly, those small, simple islands have been knocked off. And uh, now, when, we, when people, um, and I recently was reading a paper by John Parks, looking at what's left to do in New Zealand. The answers are quite complicated. We've done a similar prioritisation in the UK for our islands. There aren't very many that are owned by a single person, ideally a government who wants to do this and, and there's no people involved. It's always involving big groups of people. And, um, and as we've heard from some of the community projects, the time to involve communities and time to get other partners on board, including sometimes funders or, or individuals who might support you, is at the start. If people are involved in building a project, they really feel like partners. Now there's a question about what are partners and what are stakeholders. And um, there are lots of definitions, as you might imagine, um, not limited to this area of work. But um, one that I quite like is a partnerships and agreement between two or more organisations to achieve a common, uh, common aims or I see it as partners are the people doing things with you, they're involved in doing things. Stakeholders are a much broader group. That can be any person or any organisation affected by what you're doing. And um, interestingly, I saw that in the PII, the Pacific Invasives Initiative guidance, there, there is guidance for a stakeholder analysis, but it doesn't really mention how you choose which organisations might be your partners, which ones you might choose to have that deeper relationship with. And I think that's something that we um, maybe want to explore. What's also of interest is that funders are also increasingly interested in partnerships and a project that the RSPB is involved with at the moment, um, the potential funder has made a, a kind of condition of the funding that there is a partnership with a community, with the community on the island, which is great and definitely deliverable, but I think it's really interesting that funders are going to push um, this area of work towards partnerships and we all need to understand what that means. And yeah, all the partners need to understand too and have a shared understanding. So one way of developing that understanding is through a written partnership agreement. And um, these do exist and they've existed for island restoration projects. Um, they're mostly not in the public domain though. And that's understandable because some of the elements of these agreements can be commercially sensitive or sensitive to organisations. But having access to good templates for these could be very useful in the future. Um, and sometimes a, a separate agreement isn't necessary, so partners, partnerships can be described within the project plan, or they can just be much more kind of fluid and just a handshake might be enough for some organisations. However, if you are going to have a partnership agreement, or even if you're not going to have a written one, the types of things that appear to be important and, important and good partnerships um, are the things I'm going to talk about now. So it won't surprise anyone that communication is one of the basics of partnerships. But it's also something that can go um, horribly wrong pretty quickly. Um, I've, I've become aware, I'm from New Zealand originally, I've lived in the UK for quite a long time, um, but I've become aware that um, New Zealanders are known for being frank, um, and that the level of frankness that we accept as normal is quite different from the level of frankness that other people might think is normal. So sometimes we have to temper ourselves or be aware of the cultural context we're working in. And sometimes the type of communications we might have amongst ourselves may be completely inappropriate to have with others. Um, and they may drive partnerships off course. 
in small communities. So some, um, one, of the work, one of the projects I've worked on was the Henderson Island um, eradication attempt in 2011, and the Pitcairn Island community was a partner in that with us. And that's a community which has only uh, less than 50 people in it, and yet communicating with them was uh, surprisingly challenging. So obviously they're extremely remote, but also um, they, don't, they don't read. Uh, well, if we emailed a communication out to one person, that wouldn't be disseminated through those 50 people. The way that we found uh, to be most effective in communicating with the broader, commun the broader kind of group of those people on the island was to get notices printed up and put up outside the shop and in the village square so that people could read them and digest them in their own time. And I think for each community that you work with or each partner, there might be a slightly different way of communicating, which can be frustrating and it certainly takes time. You also have to consider the amount of communication that you want to do. Um, and, and also I think being, uh, being aware of people's different motivations. So some partners may be particularly interested in certain aspects of the project and not so interested in others. Um, clearly defined roles is important. So. Um, in any group of organisations, um, everyone might think that they're going to be the boss. And I think it's really important to have it clear who's doing the work and who's making the decisions and who's directing. Um, one, part, one specific to island work, an area where, I've, where a few of us have um, seen uh, differences in this, is who's going to prepare the island for the eradication. So, um, so where you have a local partner and you might expect they're all geared up, they're going to cut all the tracks and your team's going to turn up and do the operation, well that can go horribly wrong unless you're very, very clear on what you expect. Um, likewise, if you have local, local partner staff that are going to be integrated into your team and you expect that they're going to do exactly what you're, the rest of your team are doing, um, that can also go horribly wrong in practice. So I think making sure that in any partnership you describe the roles you expect people to do and you just keep saying it and make sure that everyone's very aware of, of expectations is, um, is important to make things go well. Um, so leadership, staffing and personalities. So um, this can be quite sensitive because um, yeah, it's hard to, hard to admit uh, that one person might be making a partnership go wrong, but that can happen. And uh, surprising that might be to many people, I'm sure. Um, People who are very driven to achieve uh, an eradication project may not be the best people to um, form collaborative partnerships which may require compromise. Um, and if you are an organisation working in a partnership, um, I think it's important to have your eyes open about what may be, where the wheels might be falling off. Um, it's also true that partnerships are formed between organisations in the world, in this modern world, but they're also made up of individuals. So if you're an organisation with staff turnover and you've made a great partnership with six organisations, you change the staff member involved in that, they may change the dynamic. So this is a plea for, um, I think as um, Xavier Lambin said, if, you've, if you have a project with lots of changes of funding, changes of staff, these should raise red flags for your partnerships and you should expect to have to invest more time into um, into those, and also for organisations doing this work, maintaining staff continuity is a really good thing. So, um, yeah, so shouts out to those organisations who, who can do that for a long time. Um, clear expectations. So, I think um, in, in the eradication world in particular, um, what happens if the operation fails? We don't want to plan for failure, we all need to plan for success, but I think it's important to be clear about what will happen if it goes wrong. Um, for Gough Island, we've been asked questions about if it fails, will you be able to come back and do it again the next year? And I think having those conversations are really important because, yeah, if it does go wrong, the last thing you want is all your partners pointing fingers. What happens if you succeed? Who's going to continue the work? Who's going to do the biosecurity? Getting those agreements early on is vital. And finally, money. So, um, yeah, in the, in the new world, I think it's increasingly unusual that all the money comes from one place. And there can be a lot of concerns amongst different organisations about who's going to own funding sources into the future, who's going to maintain donor relationships. Um, and all those conversations, again, um, should be spelled out or at least understood early to, to avoid a lot of problems. Now, um, yeah, as I'm not an expert on partnerships, all of you are working in partnership, I think, now. I've heard the word so much this week. Um, 
all of these operations and more wouldn't have happened without partnerships. So this is something that's becoming bread and butter for us. But I think um, it would be really useful to, to, certainly to me, if I could easily access templates that other people have used to form partnerships, to form their advisory groups, how you manage these kind of interactions. And I think um, this is, as alongside the science of eradication, which so many people in this room are experts at, the art is becoming increasingly important, or the social science. Everyone's got to take a drink of the Kool-Aid, which uh, James mentioned in his talk. Um, thank you for listening, and good luck with all your partnerships. You'll need it, but they're well worth having, and, uh, and through those we can all deliver more. Thank you. Any questions for Claire? <laughs> well, on the side there, yeah, thanks. I'm glad that you mentioned the worst case scenarios and what if you fail, because I think the approach we've been adopting has been bookending. So looking at worst case, best case scenarios, and it's most evangelical folks only think about the positive, great outcomes and uh, can get a bit of a shock when things fail. So I think bookending is pretty good. The other technique we're using is outcome mapping and outcome harvesting. So log frame traditionally looks at attribution, but outcome harvesting, outcome mapping, look at contribution. That really helps because people get very jealous about their territory. So that helps with a partnership approach. Just an observation. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Any others for Claire? Yes, down the front. <coughs> I think another type of partnership we need to, partnerships we need to think about is um, what other organizations could help us deliver, particularly now that we have got this biodiversity and livelihoods, biodiversity in communities, so there are partners who are good at doing that, not people who are doing conservation. So I think it's time for us to reach the, the development sector, tourism sector, you know, people who can do that kind of staff and do it well and leave us to ourselves to our knitting you know we're good at doing that and we bring the people who help us to do the rest yeah no i totally agree so i don't i think um i had a very similar conversation earlier and building on what uh, david said david moberly wherever he is um there are already lots of good partnerships i think it's time for us if we really want to scale up we need to ramp up and have those conversations with different audiences and make new partnerships yeah okay thank you claire And our last speaker, not only of the session, but of the entire conference, is Steve Cramwell, who you may remember from the first session today. And Steve is talking on multi-island, multi-invasive species eradication in French Polynesia demonstrates economies of scale. Take it away, Steve. Well, thanks, Tony. Uh, you're still here. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, this is, this is possibly one talk too many for you, and I suspect for those that uh, endured the first one, two talks too many for you. But, um, um, yeah, this, this, this is a, absolutely a highlight of my career, uh, this, this project, and um, while well, I'm sure I'm not going to manage to do it a full uh, uh, service in, in 10 minutes, I'll attempt to at least paint the picture of what we accomplished. So, uh, this presentation, I just want to take you through uh, briefly the, uh, the project that was completed in 2015. Uh, through a partnership um, around uh, obviously removing invasive species from six islands in French Polynesia. Um, that partnership was, was uh, one of, uh, well it was a partnership of many and uh, BirdLife, um, the national partner, uh, the Ornithological Society of uh, French Polynesia or Sop Money, which makes for a less of a mouthful, um, and Island Conservation were the the key protagonists in that, and um, I will uh, hopefully manage to highlight um, many of the others as we go through. Uh, so where were we? Uh, pretty much in the centre of the Pacific. That, those red blobs are French Polynesia. Um, the islands of interest uh, were 1,500 kilometres from Tahiti, which might be difficult to find on their map. Oh, it's the yellow blob. Uh, and the, we're right in the right in this sort of southern corner. Um, so the Actian Islands group um, and the Gambia Islands, of which the Actian, more to the north, 
was about 300 kilometers roughly from um, the Gambias in the south. Um, this one is, yeah, really just to illustrate that, that uh, uh, the Actian archipelago is, is uh, well, it's, well, it's not really, but anyway, there's, there's four atolls in it. Um, and the northernmost one, which is the top one in that uh, image, was, uh, has never had rats, which is a very rare thing for any part of the Pacific. Um, and is, yeah, well, one of two sites in uh, the Tuamoto archipelago, which is that, that full uh, body of islands uh, that uh, has no rats. So hugely significant for conservation and supports... Uh, uh, the critically endangered uh, Polynesian ground dove and the endangered Tuamotu sandpiper and is pretty much a stronghold for that population or those species or certainly the ground dove. Um, Gambias, so uh, it's, a, it's an island group as I say right in the south. Um, uh, the project was focused on three small islets, uh, Makaroa, Manawi and Kamaka in that grouping and also uh, Temawi which is about 40 kilometres uh, further south yet uh, from there but is part of that same group. Um, as I say, it, it aimed to uh, protect the Polynesian ground dove, it was one of the key species. Uh, also uh, the Tuamotu sandpiper uh, which is endangered, uh, the Polynesian storm petrel also endangered uh, and a whole bunch of other seabirds, uh, 19 of them in total. Uh, I think this is probably Murphy's petrel. Or, yeah. Um, oh, okay, I'm going backwards. And oh, atoll fruit dove, uh, that's near threatened. Um, so yeah, there was, there was a good representation of, of biodiversity among that uh, island group, those six islands. Uh, Planning for the project started uh, about, well, it, it kind of started on the back of the, the first attempt, which was in 2001, and um, that didn't work out so well. So um, we, it was picked up again by um, uh, a number of partners uh, soon after that, and um, uh, particularly uh, Sopmanu, um, who uh, worked with uh, New Zealand Department of Conservation and PII um, that saw a, a, um, a research study that was done uh, by Richard Griffiths, who many of you will know, um, and uh, essentially looked at some of the key issues that were underlying that initial failure, which was essentially the, uh, the looming problem of, of crabs in terms of their uh, uh, consumption of bait, and uh, that at least uh, answered the question around what sort of bait quantities are likely to be necessary for the operation. Um, so how did it all unfold? Uh, it, was, it was, yeah, as I say, in terms of the, the focus around this particular operation, there was at least two years of, of solid, um, uh, or many would say grief, but planning in um, getting it together. Uh, we had about 90-odd thousand tonnes of bait, um, 30, an insane number of uh, litres of jet fuel, 30,000 I think it was, um, a helicopter um, and the usual buckets and equipment and so on, all of which had to be taken that 1,500 kilometres, well at least, uh, often much further from Tahiti to, uh, to these sites. Um, the, the equipment was offloaded at, at each site um, and yeah, as part of that process we also uh, flew the boundaries for each of the islands. Uh, the offloading process took about um, uh, took about five days uh, to complete because we had to um, uh, hop around uh, each of the islands and this is kind of an illustration of, of the that sort of logistical side of things so uh, as I say um, equipment was shipped uh, not as direct as that that uh, line is suggesting um, it actually had to stop at probably about 10 atolls en route and um, uh, took, took about uh, the best part of a month before it got to Vahanga which is in the um, Actian group and that was the first point of uh, the offloading process. Uh, the helicopter did this uh, island hopping um, from Tahiti to um, well, Ana and Hau before it, it also ended up in uh, Turaya and magically somehow both the boat and the helicopter were there at the same time. Um, 
and as well as the, the, uh, the crew. So we, we flew to um, one of the outermost atolls and then joined the vessel. Um, and then, as I say, all, all united at, at Vahanga where the, uh, the loading commenced. Um, and then from, from Vahanga it went on to, uh, to, um, to there, uh, to the Gambias. And yeah, as I say, that was about a and then on to Temui, uh, and then back again, and uh, yeah, we were set to go. Um, there were some, some uh, non-target issues that needed to be managed. Uh, as I say, a couple of critical species. One of them, uh, yeah, so in, in dealing with that, essentially what we attempted to do, to do was catch all the uh, ground doves on uh, Vahanga, so that was the only atoll or site of those six that had um, uh, ground doves present pr prior to the baiting, and uh, uh, shift them over to the, the rat-free atoll that I was talking about, Tenoraro, which is in that same group. And um, that worked, yeah, that worked pretty well. Um, uh, it was a major effort. Um, you know, the, uh, the atoll Vahanga is about 300 odd hectares, so trying to you know, find a, a bunch of little brown birds in that is, is like looking for a needle in a haystack. But uh, yeah, there was a team of about um, eight, eight or so people that did that over a sort of two week uh, period prior. And the, the other one, the Polynesian, uh, sorry, the Tuamotu Sandpiper, um, that, was, that was present, but in very low number. And uh, more significantly, uh, it, was, it was present on other atolls uh, in, in far greater number, fortunately. And uh, so in terms of, you know, uh, a population impact from, from baiting that was never going to be particularly high. So while we tried to, to, um, uh, to minimise the risk to them by obviously taking them off as well, we couldn't actually get them all. Um, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the baiting, baiting commenced um, and essentially that was following the, the best practice guidelines that um, were developed um, yeah, not long before this operation um, took place. Uh, th those are the best uh, tropical guidelines, I should say. And yeah, it was able to benefit, benefit from that knowledge of Henderson, Palmyra, um, no, uh, well, yeah, Palmyra, but Wake and uh, Enderbury, which were a, a particular focus of, of those reviews. Um, it involved two applications of 30 kilograms a hectare, and, um, and there was a period of about 18 days uh, between the first and the second uh, application. And uh, we used uh, Bell Labs uh, wet, wet uh, bait formulation. Uh, yeah. Flying donuts is complicated, so um, uh, they, yeah, as, as you can imagine, there's a huge proportion of edge, obviously, to interior, and uh, you've got all these little wee uh, motu that, that essentially, yeah, islands, islands in themselves. And uh, so we, to manage that, uh, we, we, we divided it into blocks, and um, um, yeah, that, that worked pretty well. Uh, there's only obviously a number of straight lines that you can fly on a circle. Um, um, the operation struck a whole heap of challenges. Uh, one of them was, was coconuts. Um, and as I say, in the, uh, in the northern group, um, Actaeon uh, had a, an active copper plantation and um, that meant that there was Loads of, loads of coconuts. So to deal with that, uh, which was obviously an alternative food for, for rats, uh, to deal with that we pretty much set the island on fire, um, but in a controlled fashion, and uh, yeah, burnt, burnt as much of the, the coconut as we could, uh, but inevitably we were unable to get it all. Um, in parallel, we were also managing rats, us, uh, cats, um, and that, that was largely through a, a trapping effort, um, some, uh, some hunting, um, and that occurred over the one month, one month period of the operation continuously. Uh, ideally, uh, we would want a longer period for uh, that, that response um, than we had, but 
uh, it proved successful. There were a number of issues that needed to be managed around uh, crabs in particular, so the traps were unbaited, they were raised, um, um, yeah, and I think probably uh, we also ran uh, um, trail cameras in parallel, uh, just you know, as a way of obviously tracking what cats were, were present, and we were able to account in terms of the trapping for all of them um, bar one. And, um, but as I say, that one was obviously uh, not that significant insofar as it perhaps was a, um, a walking dead cat from Bridifkin because there was no sign of them in the monitoring subsequently. Rabbits, they're another one. Uh, that was, they mostly, um, were mostly impacted by, oh damn, the, uh, the bait and uh, three or four were shot uh, that, that had remained. One of those was a, a hopping dead rabbit um, and the others were, yeah, seemingly unaffected by the bait. So that was, that was also a... Um, um, uh, Manawi, yeah, okay, it was a small island, but yeah, really just, a, and that's a, an illustration of the effort in terms of hunting the rabbits, um, but yeah, ideally more, uh, more time would have been uh, perfect. Um, this is Makaroa, this had goats, um, local advice was such that there were none um, left before we arrived, we arrived, there were plenty, there was about eight, I think, or ten, um, we did what we could to, to remove them, um, but that had to be dealt with subsequently because we just hadn't planned for that as a significant part of the, that operation and they have been subsequently eliminated. Um, okay, so just quickly some uh, conclusions. So the, the project was uh, successful at, at uh, five of the six sites um, uh, and we are going through a review process to understand why it is that uh, the one on Kamaka failed um, having a, a multi-island and um, a multi-species operation is way more complex, um, but the return on investment is, is significant. So essentially the cost, if you like, of having done those six or five that were successful was equivalent to having done maybe one or two independently. Um, Partnerships, uh, Claire and, and others, and uh, you know we've, we've we've touched on that. It was really the crux to uh, the success of these operations, and um, uh, the we were able between uh, New Zealand Department of Conservation (PII), Island Conservation, BirdLife, Sopmanu, and others, able to bring uh, unique and complementary skills to the many technical, social, um, logistical. Um, elements of the project. Uh, massive planning effort and the, the great news is it's going to uh, obviously lead to a downlisting for a couple of species, uh, the ground dove and Tuamotu sandpiper, hopefully in the not too distant future, and it sets a fantastic uh, platform I think for uh, doing more in French Polynesia, which is our immediate intention, but also I think is a bit of a model for the region. And just a huge thanks to uh, many of the partners that are here um, for making this possible and also for, to Bell Labs and having sponsored uh, the bait, which was yeah, really substantial. Thanks, everyone. I know people want to get away sharply after lunch, some of you, so I, I think uh, we'll draw the session to a close there. Steve, thank you so much indeed. Two valiant efforts in one morning. Well, we got there, folks. That wet evening at Discovery Point seems a very long time ago now, doesn't it? During the last five days, we've had 170, I think, amazing presentations, posters and talks. Thank you so much to everyone who's contributed to the conference by producing one or more of those. 19 sessions, many of them parallel, as you know, 275 attendees, and two years of preparation focused on just five days. But the conference is not over in that, feverishly, 
Dick Veitch will be leading a team of people to produce a published proceedings, which will be a very weighty tome, I think equal in size to the last one, so at least we'll have a matching pair. Oh, no, actually, it'll be three, it'll be three won't it? Um, and uh, I thought it would be appropriate for Dick to come up and just give you a summary of where he is uh, with the proceedings, and no doubt berate some of you who haven't yet put in your paper. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Sitting there and listening to Claire's talk, um, I suddenly realized I should have had, I should, I'm the man in the hole in the middle, and I should have had those PR experts behind me along with a few others. Um, I do appreciate that my PR skills are not up with that. We heard earlier in the week how biologists are the worst people for trying to attract funding and other things. However, the uh, proceedings will progress basically in the same manner as they have for the past two conferences and they now get accolades as being highly referred to. And I feel very sorry for the authors who made a presentation and then said, I don't have time to write a paper. They don't have time to put their name before the public, and I think they're missing out on a great opportunity. I now have 109 papers in my list. 60 of them have been completed to a point where I can work on with them. The rest are still promises, which I hope will come to fruition. The process from here on is that each paper will be help, hopefully standardized to a degree. I will get back to some authors to improve graphics in many of them. And then they go out for peer review. I've already identified most of you as one of the peer reviewers of one paper, because even if you don't think you're an expert in some other aspect that you've listened to during this conference, you are perfectly capable of looking at it and saying, what is missing from this paper? What could this author add? What could this author do? I'm doing my best to keep rat people looking at rat papers and fish people looking at fish papers, but it doesn't always work. When that peer review is completed, the paper goes back to the author, and we hope the author will do things quickly to renovate it, and so the process goes on. The plan is to have the book out within one year. If it's not, you'll know I'm half dead or something else has happened. <laughs> because I'm putting wood turning aside for a wee while in the interests of Ireland invasives. <laughs> You'll hear from me again. <laughs> the task of editing the proceedings is an enormous one. Um, it would be enormous even if the book was a fraction of the size of what I know is going to come out of this. So thank you very much, Dick, on all our behalf. Um, Mick, would you like to come up? Um, we have a, a very small momentum. You, you may know that Dick has, has been pivotal to all three of the Ireland Invasives conferences. And um, in, in recognition of that and in giving advance thanks for killing himself over the next year and giving up his wood turning for a while, we have a, a little uh, gesture. I'd like to say a few words as well. Um, Yes, and th that is um, to firstly to thank Tony and Alison and the team for a fantastic conference. It's really been, been wonderful, a great job, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. So thank you. Um, Thank you, and thanks all of you for coming along for the, to the third of these conferences. This series of conferences would never have happened at all without Dick. Dick came up with the idea in the first place. I was then the chair of the Invasive Species Specialist Group based at the University of Auckland. He came to me and others with the idea we should have this conference, and we said, oh, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came to us again about seven or eight years later and said, what about another one? We said, well, right, okay. A um, bit more enthusiastic, uh, and, and, and so it goes on. So and we're now in the third one, uh, and there will hopefully be more, maybe one in Mexico or somewhere would be wonderful. 
but, but um, Dick is really the person who came up with this idea. He has been the driver. He's relentless in his, in his work, in the editing. Um, I really think he deserves a huge accolade for all he's done. And I have a little present here from the South Georgia <coughs> Heritage Trust, which is actually a bird, but you mustn't put a band on this one. Um, but I think um, overall we need to thank Dick uh, for all he's done and all he continues to do uh, in this field. So thank you, Dick, very much. Next up on the list, you, I hope, are aware that we said that we would give awards for the best student presentations, both poster and spoken. And Xavier Lambin from Aberdeen, who's here somewhere, I trust, he's right there, um, has been kindly coordinating the scoring uh, of the, I think it's 18 different uh, presentations and he's going to announce the winners, and we have a little gift. And I'll, I'll say what they are, because you probably don't know. Um, so there's a, a certificate for each of the, the two winners, and two books. One of them is uh, from Alan Tai, Invasive Alien Species in the Seychelles. He says, no, it's not from him. Do you want to explain? <laughs> oh, OK. So, I thought. I thought, I thought Alan had something to do with this. Oh. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, thought, I thought Alan had something to do with it. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for clarifying this. But the, the, name of the, book, the title of the book is still the same, Invasive Alien Species in the Seychelles. And the other one is the South Georgia book. Thank you, Xavier. Excellent. So, so uh, as a community of uh, practitioners and researchers, we not only want to do some great work, some, do so, uh, some good science, but we also want to invest and develop the next generation because surely they will, they will carry on the work. So over the last uh, the four days, uh, we had uh, 11 judges, which I will, uh, who I will name, who had been uh, uh, faithfully attending talk and scoring on the quality of the science, the quality of the presentation, how well the science was framed, or how exciting the results were, and you know, what, what you like about a good talk. So you know, the people who have been uh, judging the talks were uh, Carol West, uh, Mick Clouch, James Russell, Claire Stringer, Laura Bambini, Pete Robertson, Chris Trowell, Graham Neville, Liz Rufino, and Tom Bodhi. So thank you to you all for your work. So then now comes the fun bits. So, the, so we have two prizes, the, the talk prize and the poster prize. So the talk prize goes to <laughs> Arnan Pili for a talk titled Threat to Philippine Biosecurity. Spatial Dynamics of Invasion and Distribution of Alien Frogs in a Biodiversity Hotspot. So I should stress that uh, the judges had no affiliation whatsoever with the talks that they were, uh, they were judging, which makes it uh, a bit easier for me to say that the winner of the poster prize is uh, Ewan McHenry uh, for a poster called The Value of Monitoring and the Price of Uncertainty in the Management of an Invasive Population. much Xavier and his team that was a lot of work I know so um, I just wanted to say um, a few words now about what might happen in the future we've already heard reference to the possible next conference and um, I'm a relative newcomer to this field seven or eight years um, my introduction was the 
conference in Auckland in 2010, and it just seemed to me and to Alison and to others who've been who benefited so much from that conference and those who've been involved in the earlier one that seven years really is too long to wait to the next one. So um, I've been thinking it would, it would be lovely if we could have expressions of interest at this conference um, to host the next one, given that it does take quite a lot of time to do it. You can't just say, oh, we're going to have one in six months' time. As I mentioned earlier, the earliest correspondence I can find between Alison and myself for this conference um, is oh, well over two years ago. It gives you some idea of how long um, it takes to do this. And um, just in the last 24 hours, I've been approached by a team of people who at least are considering um, hosting the conference. And is there someone here who'd like to say something about that? There are a nominee. Yes, thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Federico Mendez with uh, Grupo de Ecología y Conservación de Islas from Mexico, but I'm representing uh, now on uh, behalf of the group of interested parties organizing what we call the Trilateral Island Initiative, which is uh, Canada, the US, and Mexico. Uh, there was a poster about it that you might bump into, and we want to share with you our interest to host the next conference in North America, say in four to five years from now, uh, but we want you to decide where you want to have it. So we're thinking in asking people for your input through a survey on three, selected, three or four selected cities across North America. So it's going to be quite a challenge to raise the already high bar from the last trade conference. I mean, Kiwis and a castle, come on. <laughs> Yet, we promise to do our best in scaling up to meet the challenge. So. North America, Island Invasives Conference 2021. See you then. We'll keep you posted. Gracias. And I would like again to thank Tony and Alison and the rest of the team. So we have some as well. Good Mexican wine, so I hope you like it. And I, I should say that both Alison and I are very happy to provide advice, assistance, whatever, um, for whoever takes on uh, the next conference. I, I think, well, actually, we've been saying that after two years, we're just about beginning to work out how to run a conference. So <laughs> if we were to do another one, we'd be really good next time. Um, so now, um, I, as, as you will have seen, um, a conference like this does take a, a lot of preparation. Um, I am the most vi visible and probably the most irritating of the, of the team, but I represent a very large group of people um, many of whom, most of whom you will have met, but each of whom have done as much work as I have. And I want to make sure that um, uh, they, they get some recognition. Um, and also behind the scenes and over a, lo a longer period of time, the program committee uh, has been instrumental in developing the conference, the, the length of it, the structure of it, the way that we um, encourage abstracts to come in, the judging of the abstracts and so on and so on how we, we construct the sessions. There's a lot of work that's been done behind the scenes. And I wanted to mention them by name, to Araceli Samaniego, Claire Stringer, Carol West, Nick Holmes, James Russell, John Croxell, Dick Veitch, Mick Clout, Keith Springer, and Piero Genovese. Some of the big beasts in the field have all contributed enormously to what you've benefited from over the last week. Thank you very much, guys and girls. <laughs> And of course, our keynote speakers, there were seven of those, Biz Bell, James Russell, Ewan Kennedy, Colin Club, Greg Howald, Piero Genovese, and Steve Cranwell. Thank you very much, guys and girls. Thank you.
And now for the home team, I'm starting off with a gentleman you've hardly noticed up at the back there, I suspect most of you, Gary, who's been filming these sessions since the beginning. Thank you very much, kind sir. <laughs> and Ollie Prince at the front. Stand up, Ollie. Show us who you are. <laughs> so Ollie did the filming in the parallel sessions downstairs in Lecture Theatre One, and he's been taking stills of you since the beginning, some of, some of which will be in focus. <laughs> Um, Jonathan Walker, over here, is, uh, from Dalhousie. Stand up, please, Jonathan, if you would. Jonathan and his team have been looking after the <laughs> AV. <laughs> the, all of the audiovisual stuff that we've um, been able to use has, has gone flawlessly. Thanks very much, guys. Really good. Much appreciated. Then um, others behind the scenes, the caterers, uh, reception staff downstairs, Debbie um, from the Dundee and Angus Convention Bureau, who I know many of you have had contact with over the last months in arranging where you're staying and getting to and from the airport, things like that. So thanks to them. And to Stark Events, Joanna was here uh, for a couple of days at the beginning of the week. Stark Events is the professional company that we, we brought in to deal with registrations because we knew that was going to be a really demanding uh, part of the whole thing, and they handled that very well. They also were responsible for hosting uh, and updating the website. Um, Elizabeth Shearer, uh, she uh, is from the University of Dundee and has been working with Alison and I since the beginning to arrange this venue, all of the rooms we've had access to, all of the, the catering, all of the tables, all of the stuff that's involved with that. Elizabeth has been great, and um, so thank you very much to her. I don't think she's in the room, is she here? No, okay. Um, then we come on to the volunteers. I think um, you will have seen them downstairs beavering away in, in a lot of capacities, and sometimes doing things that, that you weren't aware of, probably like carrying the poster boards, all 80 of them, in and out of the building. So thank you very much for that. And uh, Sarah Lurcock, um, is, was the, the leader of, of that team. Um, would all of you, all of the volunteers, please come down and um, receive the, the thanks from, from the, the people here. <laughs> come on, don't be shy. <laughs> First prize is a copy of my book. Second prize is two copies of my book. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, Nikki, please return up here. Yes, because you just got to thank, uh, thank you for one thing. Nikki has been working with Alison and I throughout the, the entire duration of the preparations for this conference. So please give her a hand. She's been absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and Mari, Mari, please. Yes, I know you don't want to, but <clears throat> Mari has been absolutely fantastic in putting together, well, a whole load of stuff before the conference, but she's the one to whom you've been sending your presentations by email and Dropbox and, and handing in, if all else fails, handing in the, 
the memory stick. So thank you very much. <laughs> and last of all, Alison. <laughs> this has been a, a, a complete partnership. We've been talking about partnerships. But uh, Alison and I have, have done this journey together. Please come up with you. <laughs> Whoever takes on the next conference needs an Alison. so surprised. Um, this conference actually began, believe it or not, in the Globe pub, which is just down the road from here. And myself and Tony and Elaine Shemelt, who's our Vice Chair of Trustees, were sitting having a, a Krabby's ginger beer. And Elaine said, wouldn't it be a nice idea to have a conference to really celebrate what had been achieved on South Georgia, try and pass on the lessons, and also to say thank you to the island invasives community who had helped us with that project so much. And Tony kind of hummed and hawed about it a little bit for a while and turned it over in his mind. But then he decided, yes, this is a good idea, we should do this. And as soon as he said that, I knew it would be a success. Because what this man says he's going to do, he does. And uh, he comes with inspiration and perspiration. This guy, and I mean it in the, absolutely the best way. <laughs> He's so committed. You know, he, he works every hour God sends, and um, you know you can rely on him. And he leads you without you even noticing that he's doing it. Um, he's, and I consider him not only the person who's led us through not just this conference, but also the Habitat Restoration Project, but one of my best friends. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work with him. So I've got a small gift for you, Tony, to say thank you so much uh, for what you've done. And it's um, a set of four charts by Bruce Pearson of South Georgia mm. and the Antarctic. And I hope you really enjoy it. so much I shall treasure those wow okay so just the last um, few seconds um, you will remember at the beginning I said that um, the motivation for putting this on was that it would give people a chance to make new contacts new friendships new collaborations and if this meeting has achieved that, then as far as we're concerned, it's been a success. And, and certainly the buzz that I've seen this week suggests that it has been. I, I hope you will agree. Uh, and um, it, thank you so much for traveling such a long way um, to be here. Um, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to host you all here in Dundee and have a safe journey home. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>